Okay, we've just about leveled out now, so I think we'll start. So afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us. Welcome to this short talk that we've, I suppose, rather mischievously entitled When Friends Become Foes. Um, what better way to celebrate the uh, last weekend of our current lockdown restrictions than a talk on solicitor and client costs? I'm glad to see the weather's a little bit miserable somewhere because it means that less people, fewer people will be uh, tempted to uh, go out to the pub for one in a beer garden before the day's out. Um, for anybody who doesn't know us already, Erica and I are two of the nine strong members of King's Chambers who specialise in cost litigation and funding matters. Uh, we've both specialised in the field of litigation costs for more than 10 years and hopefully today we'll be able to give you a little insight into where we think um, the issues that were addressed in the case of Belsner are likely to go in the course of appeal and um, perhaps one or two issues that weren't addressed in Belsner that we think might be dealt with either in that case or um, in other cases. So this, uh, this afternoon seminar is going to start with a, a brief review of the facts uh, of Belsner, the arguments that were run in that case and the conclusions of Mr. Mr. Justice Lavender uh, in the first appeal. Um, then, as permission to appeal has already been granted by the Court of Appeal in Belsner, we'll look at, rather than spending too much time looking at the, uh, the basis of Lavender's decision, um, we'll look at the strength of the competing arguments, how they might be resolved by the Court of Appeal in due course, and ultimately what can and, and should be done um, by solicitors in the meantime. At the end of today, this afternoon's session, we'll leave some time for questions and answers. Um, there is a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, or it might be somewhere else on your screen, depending on the device that you're using. Feel free during the course of the talk to ask questions in there. Um, it might be best to keep them to the end uh, so that you know we haven't answered them during the course of the seminar. Uh, and if you pop your questions in there, we'll do our best to answer them at the end. So I'll start us off with a brief look at the facts in Belsner. Um, Miss Belsner was a pillion passenger on a motorcycle involved in a collision in February uh, 2016. She suffered modest injuries and instructed the defendant's firm of solicitors to bring uh, the matter on her behalf. Uh, and they did that doing the or using the RTA protocol. Uh, the defendant sent a detailed letter, client care letter to the claimant enclosing terms of conditions of business uh, and a conditional fee agreement, which largely followed the Law Society model, which of course will be um, important when we look at the application of this case beyond uh, the facts of it. Those documents expressly provided a number of things. Firstly, the documents established a primary liability for basic charges calculated on an hourly rate, uh, hourly rate basis in the event of a win, plus a success fee and disbursements. They indicated that the claimant was likely to be able to claim at least part of the basic charges and disbursements incurred from her opponent. They provided for a 100% success fee capped at 25% of the damages, albeit expressly stating that there may be other costs and disbursements to be deducted from your damages, such as the insurance premium. They indicated that in cases involving road traffic accidents worth less than £25,000, the amount of costs that the opponent would be liable to pay was fixed by the civil procedure rules. So the, the retainer expressly um, gave that warning of the existence of fixed costs uh, in cases worth less than £25,000. Uh, and they reserved the right to charge the claimant the actual costs incurred, taking into account any recoverable costs from the defendant, so taking those off, uh, and that the um, costs payable by the client may exceed the costs recoverable from the opponent uh, and that the claimant would have to bear the shortfall. <clears throat> Importantly, they also indicated that the um, most claims settle after medical evidence has been served, and they gave a costs estimate to settlement to that stage. Um, in other words, to stage two of the RTA protocol. And the estimate that they gave in this case was two and a half thousand pounds plus VAT. Uh, and those amongst you who um, deal with RTA litigation work will know that stage two the recoverable base profit costs are only 500 pounds. So the estimate, uh, estimated cost based on the hourly rate provided for in the retainer uh, was about five times that which might be recovered at that stage. Uh, equally crucially, as Erica will come on to address um, very shortly, none of the documents, the retainer letter or the CFA, provided for an overall cap on the amount of costs recoverable by the defendant firm from their client, the claimant. 
um, entirely understandably, given that this, these documents were entered into within a month of the accident, uh, the retainer was entered into within a month of the accident, no estimate of damages was given to the client at that stage, no evidence having been obtained. So the claim um, pursued its normal course, it got to stage two, the stage two settlement pack uh, was sent with the medical evidence and ultimately an offer was made and accepted, which resulted in damages being paid uh, a little over £1,900 and fixed costs and disbursements being paid at uh, £1,783 uh, and 19 pence inclusive of VAT. That included, of course, the £500 plus back profit cost that was payable fixed cost payable under the um, fixed cost regime. The defendant firm then deducted the sum of £385.50 from the claimant's damages. I have to say it's not entirely clear from reading the judgment why that sum was deducted. It, it amounts to just over 16% plus VAT of the damages or, or just over 20% inclusive of VAT. Uh, and there is some comment by Mr Justice Lavender uh, as to um, the to the effect that there may have been an error in calculation, but that was the level of success fee and it certainly didn't breach the statutory cap. The claimant then instructed Check My Legal Fees, who issued a Part 8 claim on her behalf for a Solicitors Act assessment, and the claimant requested a statute bill from the defendant, which was ultimately served in May 2018, and that statute bill included the following charges. Basic charges are just over £2,171 plus VAT, a success fee, as I've said, at 385 50 a GP report fee, 225 plus VAT, and a psychologist report fee, £806 plus VAT. So the bill total was just over £4,300. From that sum was deducted the amount recovered from the defendant in costs from the opponent, which, as I said earlier, was just over £1,780. And so that left a notional balance of £2,522.88. Given that the damages that were recovered were only £1,900, that meant that if the contractual liability was enforced to its fullest extent, it would have meant that the claimant's damages were entirely uh, extinguished and that the claimant had a residual liability to the solicitor for just over £600. In the event, the defendant um, firm agreed to limit the costs that they sought from the claimant to the uh, figure initially deducted from the damages, the success fee uh, of £385.50. Nevertheless, the claimant sought an assessment contending that she hadn't given informed consent to pay more than was recovered from her opponent. So I'm just going to take a moment now to look at the two areas of law, uh, the two pieces of, of law um, that were relevant to those questions. The first is a uh, long-standing piece of legislation, the Solicitors Act 1974, with which no doubt most of you, if not everyone here, is already familiar to some extent, um, and Section 74.3, which warrants consideration in full, and it provides, as is set out on the slide, the amount which may be allowed on the assessment of any costs or bill of costs in respect of any item relating to proceedings in the county court shall not, except insofar as rules of court may provide otherwise, exceed the amount which could have been allowed in respect of that item as between party and party in those proceedings, having regard to the nature of the claim uh, and of any counterclaim. So that's what the Solicitors Act says, and the eagle-eyed amongst you will have already spotted that it provides except in so far as the rules of court may provide, uh, and of course the CPR, the Civil Procedure Rules, do provide uh, accordingly at, uh, excuse me, at Rule 46.92. Uh, and that uh, provision provides, again, as is set out on the slide, Section 74.3 of the Solicitors Act applies unless the solicitor and the client have entered into a written agreement which expressly permits payment to the solicitor of an amount of costs greater than that which the client could have recovered from another party to the proceedings. Thus, the question became whether the retainer in uh, Ms. Belsner's case was sufficient to comply with Rule 46.92 in order to disapply Section 74.3 of the Solicitors Act. Now, I'll, I'll hand over to Erica at this point, who'll take you through the arguments adopted by the parties in Belsner and how Mr Justice uh, Lavender determined them. Thank you, Kevin. So if we move on to the next slide, what we have um, here 
is the first instance decision of Bellamy. Now, District Judge Bellamy sits in the um, Sheffield County Court and also deals with the partake costs claims in the Sheffield District Registry. He's got quite a, a, a deep understanding, I think it's fair to say, of Solicitor Act matters, because um, for those of you who are familiar with the area, the vast majority of checkmylegalfees.com and also James Green, um, the two real leaders, I suppose you could say, um, in terms of claimant work, all issue out of Sheffield. So he's got a significant understanding. And of course, you probably will have seen him from dealing with the first instance decision in Herbert. Now, what um, District Judge Bellamy does is he has a process of applying, in effect, provisional assessments to solicitor act assessments. There's no specific um, procedure for the provisional assessment process to be followed within solicitor act assessments. So what he's done is, in effect, created his own, which is sensible given constraints of proportionality. So what you'll have and what you'll see from Belsner is we have a split decision. So the paper assessment, understandably, similar to provisional assessment, it will have been dealt with within a 30 minute box work um, appointment. And he dealt with it the first instance on paper and said, it's difficult to see how informed consent could be given. So what he did there, you can see, is he seemed to have accepted that informed consent was in play in order for it to be determined thereafter that informed consent had to be given. Um, unsurprisingly, the defendant sought an oral review and matters being as they are on oral reviews, it got uh, the arguments became significantly expanded upon and um, Judge Bellamy had more time to consider matters. And what he did was he overturned his decision after the oral review and he said this, I think to import informed consent places the burden too high. It simply has to be an express term and an express term is a term that is clearly set out in the agreement and about which there can be no doubt. I am satisfied that this document meets that test. So what you have there is he's looked at the provision in 74 subsection three and he's applied it on its natural and ordinary meaning of the words. And he said, you'll have to forgive me, my cat is driving me mad today and won't go away. Um, he clearly has a very deep interest in solicitor act assessments. Um, and what he said, looking at that, was no, that the requirement of 74.3 doesn't engage informed consent because it's not there as a matter of language. So he said it simply has to be an express term. So consequent to that, he found against the claimant and found that 74.3 had been complied with and there was no difficulty in it. Um, if we then go to the next slide, um, unsurprisingly, the claimant appealed. And the appeal went before Mr Justice Lavender. And when it reached him, he broadly dealt with two issues, as you can see there on the page. First of all, he dealt with whether informed consent was required at all. And second of all, if it was, then was it evidenced on the documents that he had before him? Now, the informed consent principle was dealt with in quite a short order. And you can see it there, it's dealt with in three paragraphs between paragraph 68 and paragraph 70. He then went on from um, 88 onwards is really where you find the crux of the decision as it related to the practical application of it. And what we're going to see now is um, the determinations of uh, within paragraph 68 to 70. And we can see that there is a significant amount of difficulty that, are, well, certainly in my opinion, are created by those paragraphs. But before we reach that, let's just have a look at the arguments, because this is a significantly interesting part, because as with all judgments, they're structured in a certain way. And you'll see that the arguments from the competing parties are set out. But there's a significant absence of um, recording, and I use that word purposefully, and we'll see why in a moment, in terms of the defendant's argument on informed consent. So this is the position that the claimant set out first. In terms of informed consent, they um, argued that the relationship between the claimant and the defendant firm was a fiduciary one. And as a consequence of that, it did require informed consent in order to retain costs over and above the fixed recoverable cost regime, i.e. the success fee and also the shortfall. So that was their first argument. And there has to be a fiduciary relationship and that fiduciary relationship requires informed consent. And um, their secondary layer of arguments was to interpret 
and uh, 46.92, and that in doing so, saying that the natural and ordinary meaning, uh, when set in the context of the entirety of 46.9, um, required informed consent. Now, that was an, an interesting position. In, in my um, opinion, it's uh, the weaker of their two arguments. Um, the reason being is that if you look at 46.9, which is the provision which predominantly engages with the um, basis of assessment for Solicitor Act assessments, you can see that when one looks at 46.9 subsection 2, which codifies within the CPR 74.3, you'll see that there is an absence there of referring to informed consent or express agreement. You contrast that with subsection 3 of 46.9, which was the provision that was dealt with in Herbert, where it does expressly say um, that uh, the claimant's express agreement has to be reached. So they try to interpret these provisions to say, well, irrespective of the natural and ordinary meaning of subsection 2, if you put it in the context of the total provision of 46.9, um, informed consent still has to be required. Um, hence the reason I say that it wasn't the best argument, in my opinion, certainly, that was put forward. And then finally, it was a practical application that there is a requirement to give an indication of the level of costs which might be recoverable from the insurers. Put otherwise, there's a requirement to say what the likely fixed recoverable costs may be so that the claimant has an understanding and an ability to compare and contrast the recoverable costs as likely to be the chargeable costs. So those are the arguments that the claimant put forward. We then move to the arguments of the defendant. And here I say is where it gets quite interesting from an analytical point of view, because um, as you can see from the final bullet point there, the defendant's position on fiduciary duty is charitably unclear. It's not cited. Now, there are two potential positions on that. Either it wasn't argued, um, given the um, level of counsel that um, is um, unusual, I would say, considering who they had on that, or, or the other alternative is that it wasn't recorded by Lavender J. Again, um, given his standing, that would be quite unusual. So we have this rather unclear and unusual situation in that the position on fiduciary duty is just not there for us to have an analysis for. But what is there is that the defendant went down the interpretation route, understandably, because it was their stronger argument. Um, and they said that on a natural ordinary meaning of 74.3 and also 46.92, that there's no requirement for um, express agreement, which is the underpinning um, in one sense for informed consent. So when one looks simply at the provision, one doesn't need to have that understanding of informed consent there. What it is sufficient is simply for the document itself to do what the provision requires, and that's just expressly set out that there is the power to charge more than the fixed recoverable costs. And this particular retainer did that as Kevin's taken you through. And thereafter, that the requirement, as the claimant suggested, to set out costs, recoverable costs from the defendant opponent. Um, in the RTA claim, that it was simply unduly onerous to set out the entirety of part 45 in terms of the fixed recoverable cost regime, that CFAs are already lengthy enough as they are, and lay clients don't want to be confused even more by um, excess and unnecessary provisions, which make the, uh, the uh, agreement unduly onerous. So those are the competing provisions or certainly the competing arguments as recorded in the judgment. Um, and you can see the arguments are set up. There is almost a mismatch in the way that the claimant has approached this and the defendant has approached this. So if we move on now to have a look at the appeal decision itself, um, first of all, the issue of informed consent. Now we look to this and we start at paragraph 68. And this um, paragraph totally encapsulates where um, Lavender Day um, analyzes the position of informed consent. Now, what he says is this. I do not consider that this appeal can be determined by a simple comparison between the wording of part 46. Now, simply in that sentence, he completely disposed of the defendant's arguments on interpretation with one swift, simple sentence. I don't consider it can be dealt with like that. And then he went on to say 
the requirement for informed consent arises because of the fiduciary nature of the relationship. So he's gone on there in one paragraph to dispose of the issue in respect of interpretation and accept that a fiduciary relationship has a requirement for informed consent, which is one of the issues that um, Kevin and I will come on to discuss momentarily about that this causes a significant problem. So we then move on to paragraph 69. And this, the, the, this paragraph as well creates a number of difficulties. So um, I am going to read it out. And if you do have this as a separate PowerPoint, in fact, I don't think you have, we haven't sent them out yet, have we, Kevin? No, not yet. No. So when this comes back, if you just highlight and tab this up, because this paragraph is of significant importance in terms of the difficulties, um, which of course um, leads on to the ways that you can actually distinguish Belsner or the matters that you need to be looking out for when the Court of Appeal decision in Belsner comes out. So he says this, it goes without saying that an agreement for the purposes of 46.9 subsection 2 must be a valid and enforceable agreement. So that's what he says, it must be a valid and enforceable agreement. Now, of course, we've got no difficulties with that as a matter of simplicity. Of course, any retainer has to be valid and enforceable. But he then goes on to say this, it follows that an agreement procured by fraud or misrepresentation would not suffice. And in that context, it seems to be saying that it wouldn't suffice to be a valid and enforceable agreement. He then goes on to say, nor would an agreement whose performance would involve a breach of fiduciary duty. And then he concludes to that extent, therefore, 46.9 subsection two requires informed consent. Again, a very perfunctory way of dealing with the issue um, and we're going to come on to as I said analyzing the difficulties with that uh, momentarily. So we then get on to paragraph 70 which says this a solicitor who wishes to this is in effect his conclusion on the point of principle and you can see that he's dealt with it within three paragraphs. A solicitor who wishes to rely on 46.9 subsection 2 must not only point to a written agreement which meets the requirements of the rule as the defendants did but must also show that his client gave informed consent. And for this purpose, the solicitor must show that he made sufficient disclosure to the client. So he's concluded on the back of 68 and 69 that there must be informed consent. And then he says, and consequently, there has to be sufficient disclosure. So then we go ahead and we look at what the practical um, factual matrix of the case was in terms of his disposal of those issues and whether informed consent was evidenced or not. So the evidence which was provided was the retainer documents. So in this situation, it's, it's quite analogous to the position that there was in Herbert in which the um, documents primarily relied upon were the retainer documents. You may recall in Herbert, there was also a curious witness statement. Um, the defendants here, Cam, moved away from that and simply relied upon the retainer documents themselves, which broadly set out the position, as you can see there in the three bullet points, that firstly, there was an express liability to pay the basic charges, which is the baseline really for engaging with uh, 74 subsection three that secondly informed um, inter-parties, informed of the inter-parties fixed recoverable costs, it informed in terms of their um, ability to recover inter-parties costs. What it didn't do, as Kevin's taken you through, is actually set out the quantum of those costs. So they've taken them halfway down the lane, but they haven't taken them the full journey in effect. And then thirdly, that um, Ms. Belsner was informed that she would only recover some of her charges. And as, as Kevin has said, this is quite important because it marries up with the Law Society's um, general model. So this is why, um, again, this is quite important as we move through in terms of distinguishing this particular decision. We then get on to the, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a little slow there, removing the slides. All my apologies. Kevin's in. Kevin's driving the. Kevin's driving today. Basically, I'm being. The, I'm being back seat driver. <laughs> terrify everyone. Well, there we are. Back to you, Erica. <laughs> He's a much better driver than me. <laughs> um, importantly, uh, the 
estimate was given to the claimant of the likely charges if it settled at stage two. Now, this is quite um, interesting, in my opinion, for a number of reasons, because what the um, what CAM managed to do was give the estimate, but of the more difficult, in my opinion, um, estimate that was possible. So they gave the estimate on the basis of basic charges, but they didn't reference it back to the stage two costs by reference to um, CPR 45. And the estimate that was given at stage two, remember that stage two is the point at which they exchange medical evidence, um, of 2,500 pounds based profit costs. And understandably, Lavender J said there was a striking contrast uh, between the 2,500 estimated base profit costs um, as compared with the 500 pound fixed recoverable costs for the same stage. And what he did was he actually went out to do some maths of his own and he figured out that the claimant would actually need to recover 3,200 pounds just to break even. Now, if you cast your mind back to the information that Kevin gave you, 3,200 pounds was significantly above that which Ms. Belsner recovered. So in this situation, she would have been out of pocket. And so what, in my opinion, that does is that very much frames and colors the decision of Lavender then as we move forward to look at the rest of the information that was given. So some of the other relevant factors that he considered quite rightly was that the claimant was a consumer. Um, in my experience, this is very much a watchword at the moment in solicitor act assessments. They're very much the courts are very much watching out for the fact that um, lay clients. So, so not we're, we're not talking about the, the solicitor act assessments involving businesses, but lay clients particularly are consumers, and there is um, very much a, a, a drive to towards consumer protection, and one can see that very much if you look through the solicitor act assessment authorities that are coming out at the moment. Secondly, at paragraph 80, that the defendant was under a professional obligation. That, of course, being the other side of the coin to the fact that the claimant is a consumer within this relationship, this professional relationship. And then third of all, that the retainer did not include a cap to a total of 25% of the damages. Um, Mr Justice Lavender alighted on the 25% um, total cap, but of course it is possible to draft retainers with greater or even lesser caps, not that I suppose that that would be very sensible from a business point of view, but the point is, is that it didn't have a cap at all in terms of the totality of the cost that could be uh, deducted. So then he said this at paragraph uh, 85, uh, pointing out the interparties recovery, uh, that it may have had an effect upon the claimant's consent to the agreement. It may, for instance, have led the claimant to ask whether her liability could be capped or to approach a different solicitor who would cap or possibly would cap her liability. And prima facie, therefore, it ought to have been disclosed. Um, again, there an understanding and a quite um, straightforward uh, paragraph in terms of his decision. We then move on to the next paragraph of paragraph 86, where he said, it does not seem to me that it would have been an unduly onerous burden to require the defendant to make this disclosure. I pause there for a moment to say, and Kevin's going to come on to this um, later on, the first instance decision of regional cost judge Ruin in the matter of Swan came to the alternative decision where he said that it wouldn't, it would have been too difficult. I think the word he used was impossible to give, um, to, to require the defendant to make disclosure as to what the fixed recoverable costs for the equivalent stage would have been. But just continuing on on paragraph 86 here, he continued to say, it involved taking the outcome which the defendant had itself assumed for the purposes of its estimate and stating what the recoverable costs might be in that case. And then at 90, again, this is the language that we pulled out earlier, a very striking feature, which is quite strong language from a judge, very striking feature. This was so striking that it ought, in my judgment, to have been brought specifically to the claimant's attention. And if she were to give informed consent to the agreement insofar as it permitted payment of costs greater than that which the claimant could have recovered from the insurers. We then move on to the next slide. Which... There before Erica carries on, you, you can see it. She's, Erica's quite right to pick out the um, terminology that's used. When you read the judgment in full, which I'd encourage everybody to do if you haven't already, it's clearly the thing which concerns Mr Justice Lavender more than anything 
is the fact that the client, it, it, the estimate of the two and a half thousand as against the 500 pound recoverable would have inevitably led to a situation whereby there was always going to be a significant shortfall. And secondly, and, and hand in hand with that first point, that because there was no cap whatsoever on what would be recovered by the claimant, he was particularly concerned that this would not just wipe out damages, but wipe them out and leave the client with that residual liability, as was the contractual position in Belsner, um, had they not uh, limited what they'd in fact deducted from the damages. So you'll see that he, he calls it a very striking feature. It's clearly the thing that taxed him the most. Um, Absolutely. And particularly when you look at that through the lens of consumer protection mm -hmm. and the courts are very, very um, used, particularly at the district bench, to dealing with issues of consumer protection um, at the moment, particularly in small claims um, where there's a significant amount of the district bench diet is consumed by um, consumer credit arguments, et cetera, of that nature. So they're quite used to having this concept of protecting consumers. So one can see very much that the lens that through Mr. Justice Lavender is viewing this is not only um, that this is a very striking feature, but that this is somebody who, who needs to have that additional layer of um, protection, perhaps one could say. So unsurprisingly, he overturned the decision of District Judge Bellamine. He found for the claimant, he disallowed the success fee in full. So the full £385 was wiped out, uh, couldn't recover that. And next stop, unsurprisingly, is the Court of Appeal. And they, uh, the defendant has been given permission to appeal. And there is a hereby date of the beginning of February of next year. Now, the real question that we're going to get into between Kevin and I now is what is the Court of Appeal going to be looking at? Um, the questions that are going to be troubling them, are they going to be limited to those questions which were um, discussed and traversed below? Or are there potentially other issues which um, could be brought up? And if so, what do they look like? What are they? And what potential conclusions will be open to the Court of Appeal having heard full argument on the point? So if I pick up there, th this is one issue which wasn't addressed in Belsner, and it's, it's not clear um, to me, and, and if anybody here was involved in that case and can offer some assistance, then please jump in. I know that Nick's made a comment, which I'll come back to in a moment. Nick, thanks for that in the chat box. Um, but it, it's, it may well be that the Court of Appeal takes the opportunity to look at the application of Section 74.3 of the Solicitors Act at all in a case where... Um, the uh, court proceedings were never issued. Because if we go back and look at the beginning, the, the first part of um, part 74.3, it says this, the amount which may be allowed on the assessment of any costs or bill of costs in respect of any item relating to proceedings in the county court. Now, of course, that section has been in place since um, 1974, since the old scale costs um, in civil cases were applicable for issued cases. And that really is the foundation, the bedrock of that provision being in the Solicitors Act. But it seems to me that there's a gateway there and it's clearly open to argument that the plain words of that um, section create this gateway through which a party who seeks to rely on the rest of the provision needs to um, pass. And in cases where um, proceedings are settled through the portal, where there are no um, proceedings, or even those cases which fall off the portal but never reach a point of being issued, there are never part seven or part eight proceedings. It seems to me that there is certainly scope to say um, that section 74.3 doesn't bite because it doesn't relate to costs in respect of proceedings in the county court. And it will be interesting to see if this is um, uh, an issue which the Court of Appeal grapples with in this case. If it doesn't grapple with it in this case, it has been raised in the case of Swan, which we'll come back to in a moment, and it may well be that uh, some authoritative court deals with it then. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, if you look at the uh, analysis of the understanding of proceedings as a concept within the CPR generally, there have been a number of competing decisions on that. But when you look at the driver behind those particular um, decisions, it's very much driven by the context and the particular mischief that the rule is intended to engage with. And there's two areas, it seems to me, of significant relevance here. It's first of all that we're talking about 
the terminology and the, the natural and ordinary meaning of the words, which of course is one of the, um, got the, the rules of course of statutory interpretation, it says relating to proceedings. So it's got quite, well, one can um, attach a wide understanding to that as a concept. It's not if proceedings are issued, it's relating to proceedings in county court. Query whether something of a, a pre-action protocol nature relates to proceedings in a county court in the situation where they're intended to avoid those proceedings um, in and of themselves. Um, but what, um, it, in my opinion, is possibly of even greater significance, um, and even when said against the previous incarnation when attached to the old scale costs, is that um, for the proceedings to have been issued in order to have attract, uh, attracted those scale costs, it could potentially um, seemingly create an unfair balance between those cases which settle at stage two and those cases which settle at stage three, particularly if you take into account the following factors, that first of all, both stages arise from the same protocol. It may be such that they've been divided into stages um, to be properly dealt with so that they can engage with a fixed cost matrix, but they arise from the same protocol and the same understanding. That secondly, in the modern era, the pre and post issue stages of that protocol are now governed by a fixed cost regime. And you can compare that and contrast it against the old scale costs which existed pre-CPR. Thirdly, that the language, as I've already said, is broad. It, con it engages with the concept of relating to rather than in the situation where proceedings are issued. Um, but possibly of um, the greater significance is this, is that the solicitor at the outset would have no ability at all to conclusively say whether this case that's before them over which the retainer um, engages would in fact settle at stage two or would actually go on and um, settle at stage three. And that you'd have a very um, uh, tension there in terms of what the retainer would be able to govern. Would you have a situation where you'd have to draft a retainer that expressly dealt with the situation of stage three settlement as opposed to stage two settlement? So you've got these difficulties. So um, in my opinion, while at first blush, there is absolutely an attractiveness to saying that those cases which are not issued won't be subject to the application of 743. Um, it seems to me that there are also compelling arguments which go further and say, actually, properly interpreted, there is an ability to say that the pre-issue -set, pre settled cases could actually be caught by 74.3. And I, for one, would be very keen for the Court of Appeal to be engaging with that as a concept, um, not only for the ability to determine a significant number of cases over which it would apply, but also um, from a, an interesting analysis point of view, it would be interesting to see them grapple with that. And um, I, I, for one, would like to see that as being one of the issues. Whether I get it, of course, or not, it's a completely different matter. Yeah, I think that they're obviously very good points. The, the, the last one in relation to the, um, you wouldn't know at the outset, it is clearly right. And um, I think if this argument has legs, it's more of a saving provision. If you haven't secured the informed consent that you might otherwise need, this might get you out of that difficulty as opposed to a prospective I don't I know that um, I'm not going to need informed consent and therefore I'm not going to try and get it at the outset. That would be a very um, dangerous uh, yeah. approach to adopt. I think the other point about how wide the scope is clearly relating to it is very broad. And as Erica says, there's nothing that um, engages with that question in this context. Um, but we can draw on other Court of Appeal authorities as to the, the scope of proceedings um, <clears throat> relating to. Um, Relating to the, the proceedings in the county courts, I think is probably the, the more difficult part because it's not just relating to proceedings generally, it's, it's specifically related to issued proceedings. So not, for example, a pre-action claim that you might say, well, it's the proceedings, we just didn't get to the point of issuing proceedings. Um, it, so it's, it's slightly more difficult there. I think in particular, though, again, looking at this from a, a retrospective position as opposed to a prospective position, one wouldn't know at the outset when you engage with the retainer whether or not you're going to reach a point where you do issue proceedings or, or, or you don't issue proceedings. Um, and there are plenty of claims that start on the portal but then drop out and part seven proceedings are, are, are necessary 
uh, and plenty of claims that don't settle at stage two and part eight proceedings are, are necessary. Once proceedings are issued, whether it be part seven or part eight, it seems to me that 74.3 probably doesn't leave that door open to argue that uh, it doesn't engage anymore. Uh, and so Erica's points are, are absolutely sound. From an absolutely practical yeah. point of view, really, if you're drafting a retainer to engage with these issues, if there's a possibility that you're going to end up at that situation, it, you, you do need that belt braces super glue approach to making sure that you are going to be covered. Yeah. So the next issue or the next difficulty we see, uh, and this will, of course, be engaged with, is um, the question of whether or not the fiduciary duty exists prior to a contract of retainer being entered into. Um, when Erica made her um, comment earlier about it not being clear from the judgment in Belsner what the defendant's position on fiduciary duty was, I'm grateful to um, Nick McDonnell, who um, wrote on the text that I think I can see, but nobody else can see uh, other than Erica, uh, that the question of fiduciary duty and whether there was a fiduciary duty owed um, at this point of entering into the retainer was dealt with in short written submissions after the hearing in Belsner. Um, and it's unfortunate that the defendant's position wasn't recorded in the judgment, but the defendant's position was that there isn't a fiduciary duty. But Eric is quite right. It's difficult to, to discern that from reading the judgment. So thank you, Nick, for, for that additional piece of information. Um, we, we think that this is probably going to be the most significant issue in um, Belsner, whether or not this fiduciary duty exists. And there are a few authorities that we've drawn on to um, try and identify what the Court of Appeal might, um, or how the Court of Appeal might approach this. If I let Erica deal with Motto and, and Adams, I'll deal with Davidson's and Surrey. Um, well, before we even get into um, Motto and um, uh, et cetera, um, the, the question really of whether a fiduciary duty can exist prior to the contract of retainer between the solicitor really engages with the question of when does the fiduciary duty arise as a matter of principle? Um, because it is established and trite as a matter of um, trite law that a solicitor client relationship is a fiduciary relationship that's established law so that's not going to be something I would imagine that the Court of Appeal is going to be going behind so once one arrives at that as the starting point really the proper question as I've said is when does that fiduciary relationship arise? Does it arise at the same time that the retainer is created? And if so, is it then disapplied during uh, contract negotiations? Because whilst there's no point direct authority on this as a point, the ex hypothesi argument that, as I understand, is being run um, at the Court of Appeal is that fiduciaries bear no duty at all when negotiating, negotiating their own terms. Now, what is abundantly clear from the body of um, law that's built up around fiduciaries is that the existence of a fiduciary duty doesn't depend upon the existence of a contract. Take, for example, the issue of unremunerated trustees. There's no contract there, but there's a fiduciary relationship. And that's where it comes from. It comes from that relationship. Um, and it comes from the existence of um, a relationship which arises out of um, a codependency almost. So you have the situation um, where uh, it's the repositing of trust and confidence from one party into the other and vesting power from one to the other. And you can see that that exists within a solicitor-client relationship, hence the reason that it is absolutely trite law. But what we need to look at quite properly is when that comes into existence so what's quite useful is if you look at it from a really practical point of view so say you're the client or the solicitor so um, the client contacts the solicitor they contact you because they've had the rta uh, and they want you to help them they, they come into you and they say look i've, I've had this accident it really hurt my neck it's dreadful um i need you to help me solicitor goes yeah don't worry I've got this, I'll look after you, I specialise in RTA accidents, um, and I'll agree to take your case on. They then send out the CFA, um, the client reviews it, signs it, returns it, or he then hand, you, you then hand the CFA in their office, you know, which is unlikely nowadays, but give them the CFA, looks at it, review it, sign it, gives it back to you, contract thereafter formed. Now that's a very um, streamlined process because of course there is issues of 
funding to be discussed? Have you got BTE? Have you got any other means of funding this accident, et cetera, et cetera? But what you have within that um, as a process is that the solicitor is advising the client undoubtedly before the contract of retainer is concluded or entered into because by the, the the time frame between the contract and the contract being formed undoubtedly includes steps which are taken on the client's behalf which engages with that trust and confidence and that um investing of power from the client to the solicitor and saying i need you to help me what is your advice so um it, it's likely therefore in my opinion um that by the that that the um, likely to be found that the fiduciary relationship does actually exist prior to the contract being formed. Now, what's the more interesting question is whether it's then frozen at the time when the solicitor is negotiating their own terms of remuneration. And this is where these four authorities become particularly useful to look at. If now, into those authorities, Erica, sorry to jump in. But the, the example Erica gives about a, a, a trustee who acts without remuneration is a really good example because, as Erica says, that clearly the requirement to um, or the fiduciary duty exists without um, mm. a, that uh, contract contract of retainer, um, where it's without remuneration. But the, there are plenty of trustees who are fiduciaries. We have to accept as a starting point that fiduciaries, um, it's trite law that fiduciaries cannot profit from their trust, but the commercial world's full of well remunerated trustees. And that's because a, a potential trustee isn't acting as a fiduciary, doesn't have that fiduciary duty when stipulating the terms of their appointment, arguably. Uh, and if a fiduciary or potential um, uh, trustee stipulates the term, terms of their remuneration before they're appointed to that position, then there's a, a, a clear argument to say that the fiduciary relationship, which subsequently follows, doesn't prevent them from profiting from the trust, from that fiduciary relationship in accordance with the terms of the appointment. What perhaps then becomes the more interesting question is, because of the potential fiduciary duty or, or the fiduciary duty that arguably exists even before the terms of the retainer are agreed, does that place an additional burden on the um, solicitor in this scenario or the trustee or whoever it might be to go be up to go further to explain the terms of their remuneration in a way that perhaps wouldn't exist in ordinary contractual negotiations even if those contractual negotiations are between uh, a business and a, a consumer and this is that hex the x hypothesi um argument that um, I, I just referred to. And it is really interesting because the point that Kevin just raised and the authority that exists, um, it engages with um, remunerated trustees who are potential remunerated trustees. So they haven't actually been um, contacted, well, they've been contacted, but they haven't been appointed yet. So there's no relationship that exists prior to them actually starting their role. And you contrast that with a solicitor situation where the client's already come into the office and they're already um, engaged with that repositing of trust and confidence from the solicitor to the client. So it seems to me that there is, uh, whilst it's an absolutely valid argument, it does seem that there is an answer to that. And this is one of the really interesting arguments that, again, we're hoping to see from the Court of Appeal when it eventually comes out, because it, it's a very um, interesting issue, which there doesn't seem to be a direct authority on at the moment, particularly in this context. And context is everything when you're talking about fiduciary duties, because very much it's arising out of that relationship between the two party so if you don't have exactly the same situation and factual matrix it can lead to different decisions and this is very clear from the authorities which um, engage with fiduciary duties but what we have here of course is a solicitor and client um, issue uh, and a solicitor and client um, context and as I've said there are four authorities which um, are quite um, illuminating on the point um, now it may be that these aren't determinative, but um, in my opinion, it's very much that they can, as I've said, they can throw quite a lot of light upon the issue. Now, the first authority which we have is Motto and Traffic Euro, which of course we'll all be quite familiar with. Um, and the old 
comments from Lord Newberger, which are over to comments, of course, and we have to accept that. Equally, we also have to accept that this was made within the context of an inter-parties um, assessment, and also that they were dealing with funding um, rather than the question of fiduciary duty. But nonetheless, Lord Newberger came out and said, until the CFA is signed, the claimant is not even a client. If they're not a client, query whether there are fiduciary as a fiduciary relationship there or not. Um, but again, as that seems to go against um, the authorities in the context of um, fiduciary duties and when they arise in terms of solicitors, it may be that this is not going to be the most illuminating. But nonetheless, we do have to accept that this is an indication, or well, this is over to comments from Lord Newberger, that until the CFA is signed, the claimant is not a client. Um, but as I've said, for those reasons, it, it may simply follow that that authority um, it exists, but it's not determinative of the issue um, because there are simply different questions that were being answered in a different context um, in, in which those questions were addressed. We then have three, um, oh, sorry, forgive me, two authorities which engage directly with Solicitor Act assessments. And then finally, Surrey and Barnett. Um, I'm just gonna deal with Davies and Jones and Fenley. This is very much the same issue as, as Adams and Al Mackey. Um, and that is um, the issues which deal with duties and rights and obligations, which have to be determined and dealt with within the body of the retainer. Both Davidson's and Adams, both, as I've said, deal with the same issue. And that is that there is a duty upon any solicitor within their retainer to make it plain that the purpose of the bills to be rendered was that their statute bills with all the rights and obligations that come with that. So what David's and Adams deal with is the information that needs to be given to a client before the client is going to be deemed to have agreed to have accepted the delivery of interim statute bills. Um, and we have both of these authorities which very much deal with that same point. But um, if there is an issue of um, a requirement when negotiating their own terms of remuneration, because it's not just terms of how much you were going to be paid, it's almost, it's all also, um, an issue of when am I going to be paid? That still comes within the context of negotiating their own terms of remuneration. And if we have issues, as I've said, set out within Davidson's uh, and also set out within Adams, I know Kevin was going to deal with this, but I'm, I am going to steal a little bit of his thunder, I'm afraid. And I hope he forgives me because these two do deal predominantly with the same point. Um, Adams saying, uh, which was a High Court decision of 2014, um, Davidson, forgive me, being a decision of Mr. Justice Roskill all the way back to 1980. So we're talking about very trite issues of Solicitor Act law and dealing with um, rights and obligations which have to be engaged with. Um, in Adams and Al Mackey, it said the client must be told of the rights that were being negotiated away and dispensed with. Now, whilst I fully accept from the starting point that there's no express reference at all to informed consent or fiduciary duties within these authorities, it is arguable that these um, authorities reference the various ingredients that are present within fiduciary duty in their relationships, and that they all ostensibly deal with the question of the disposal of rights and obligations that the solicitor has a duty to engage with before contracts are formed and in respect of the nature of the fiduciary terms of those engagements. So um, if you look at it through the, um, the, the prism of current and nearly 40 years old now, I hesitate to say that because I was born around that time, um, authorities um, engaging with what must go into a retainer when the solicitor is um, dealing with their rights and obligations they're under. Um, it, it does seem to be such that these fiduciary relationships or the ingredients certainly which make up these relationships do exist and they continue on. So query whether it is right that the, the um, when uh, negotiating the terms of their own remuneration, there is a freeze or a moratorium upon the fiduciary relationship and the fiduciary duties such that the solicitor says, um, I've advised you properly now, that was my fiduciary relationship. I'm now going to take that hat off I'm now going to stand back because I'm no longer a fiduciary and I'm no longer acting in that capacity because I'm negotiating my own terms. Because that's effectively what the defendant is saying, that it's almost this ebb and flow and um, of when the fiduciary duties exist 
uh, and when they don't during the course of this relationship. Um, but as I've said, if you look back over the authorities that exist, it doesn't seem to be the case that there is that ebb and flow. It does seem to be more of a linear application of these fiduciary duties and um, the obligations which are placed upon a solicitor in consequence. So um, the next authority is Surrey, um, which Kevin's going to take you through. Just picking up on one point that Eric has just made there, particularly in relation to motto, and it's a question that's coming from Jamie, um, which is a good one. One wonders whether the fact that a retainer might be retrospective so as to cover work undertaken before the CFA is in fact signed, to cover that first attendance, to cover perhaps a letter of advice that went out that alongside the retainer, etc. Um, whether that will have any bearing on whether the fiduciary relationship exists earlier than um, the date upon which the retainers entered into, which is a really good point. Excellent point. It, it Excellent. probably does, um, and that perhaps is in contrast or conflict to some extent with Motto, albeit Motto is dealing with, with very different points. So far as Surrey is concerned, it, it's a similar theme and it doesn't really add too much, but it's another example of a, a more modern authority that has um, at least touched on this concept of a fiduciary relationship between solicitor and client and informed consent particularly paragraph 61, which I'll, I'll read, it's very short. It says this, this is a reflection of the fundamental principle of equity that where a person stands in a fiduciary relationship to another, the fiduciary is not permitted to retain a profit derived from that fiduciary relationship without the fully informed consent of the other. Now, of course, in that case, in Surrey, those of you that remember that case, it was about a switch from a legal aid um, funded uh, action to a conditional fee agreement shortly before J Day, as it became known uh, in, on the 1st of April 2013. The obvious distinction there is that by at the time that the client was given the advice to switch to a conditional fee agreement, which had uh, an obligation to pay a success fee in addition to the base costs, the claimant was already a client of the solicitors because they, there was a legal aid contract in place. And so there couldn't have been any argument in the Surrey case that the fiduciary duty didn't exist because there was already that solicitor-client relationship for a number of years before the point at which the advice that was being considered was given. But it is perhaps another useful example of circumstances in where the, the Court of Appeal in that case was prepared to accept as a, a matter of trite law um, that fiduciary relationship between solicitor and client in, in terms of advice about retainers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm conscious of the time, it's nearly five o'clock, so we won't keep you for too much longer. But the next question, very briefly, is about what the effect of a breach of fiduciary duty is. And there's some interesting questions about whether or not that renders a contract voidable as opposed to void. And that's dealt with briefly, albeit again in different circumstances in Birmingham City Council and Ford and the references on the slides. Um, probably the most interesting question, if we just cut to the nub of this, is whether a voidable contract can be voided by a party, most likely in this scenario, the client, after the retainer has come to an end. And one wonders, when I say come to an end, I mean all of the obligations under the retainer have been completed. The solicitor's done their work, the case has been won, the damages have been recovered, the, bill, the solicitor's bill has been paid, uh, and then um, there's a period of time thereafter the retainer's um, completely concluded. And that relationship has ended. And one wonders if the retainer can be voided at that stage. Perhaps even a, a more interesting question might be if the, the client hasn't paid the um, solicitor's bill. So, for example, where the claim has been won, damages have been recovered, those damages sit on the client's account until such time as the interparty's costs have settled. And in that interim period, a client seeks to void the contract because they become aware of the fact now that the solicitor's taking perhaps more than they anticipated from their damages or um, simply takes a, a view that that was um, a, a contract that they entered into without informed consent, perhaps having taken advice. Really interesting questions. I, I don't, of course, have the answer to them, but it, it will be interesting to see how the Court of Appeal wrestles with that particular issue. And particularly, I think Erica might just touch on now how that um, remedy exists if a client does seek to void a contract at that stage. Yes, thank you, Kevin. So what this issue particularly engages with, it engages back with that problematic paragraph of 69, the paragraph I told you to get your highlighter out and highlight when you, um, whether it be on a printed copy or um, on your 
um, computer. So what you'll recall that Lavender said is that it has to be a valid and enforceable agreement. And as Kevin's rightly said, well, we know from Ford and Birmingham City Council that um, what one has to do, of course, is uh, in contractual situations, um, whether it's costs or otherwise, um, what you have is that you can have a voidable contract or you can have a contract that is void. And there is a significant distinguish, uh, uh, difference between the two and uh, an agreement procured by um, fraud or misrepresentation as Lavender engaged with or fiduciary duty breaches wouldn't necessarily make a contract void as a matter of principle. What it does is it makes it voidable because it creates the right of rescission for an aggrieved party. But of course, that right has to be exercised. It can't just exist in a vacuum. Somebody has to do something about it. And that's the argument, of course, that was set forward in Ford and Birmingham City Council. So what this does is it gives the right of rescission for the claimant in this circumstance as being the aggrieved party. Um, but what then thereafter happens um, is that the client has to actually do something about it. And the um, issue which comes forward here is, well, what do they do about that? And is this actually an argument um, that can be had within the context of a Solicitor Act assessment? Because what it does, it gives the right to um, disgorge the solicitor's profits, the ill-gotten gained profits. And that's what the um, right of rescission creates. It doesn't necessarily create a right that is exercisable within a Solicitor Act assessment. Well, that, um, in my um, opinion, is, is the interesting question, because if it doesn't create a right that is exercisable within a Solicitor Act assessment, i.e. can these arguments to hold the solicitor to an account, because that's the equitable remedy, so it's a remedy for an account for the solicitor to disgorge their ill-gotten gains. Um, is it really that that is a Part 8 claim under a Solicitor Act assessment? Or is it right that actually that's a proper part seven claim that needs to be dealt with in a different jurisdiction? And if it's dealt with within the different jurisdiction under part seven claims, importantly, of course, part seven is subject to the small claims limit, which part eight is not because it's automatically allocated to the multi-track. And if it's um, and that's where you get the additional costs of course um, which are capable of being recovered and so feeding the new solicitor act assessment um, market but if these arguments are properly to be had within a part seven context and then subject to the fixed cost regime of the small claim track because we're only talking about a few hundred pounds you're going to have an issue where you're going to cut off that market right at its ankles because there's not going to be the money to be funding it to take these arguments forward. So it seems to me that this is a really strong argument for somebody to be having um, in order to take these um, matters forward because not only is it going to cut the issue of fiduciary or sorry forgive me it's not going to necessarily engage with the issue of fiduciary duty um, um, it, in so much of it as a matter of principle, but it's going to go wider than that. It's going to affect the marketplace because if it can be shown that it is properly a part seven argument rather than a solicitor act assessment argument, then you're going to limit that market. And if you limit the market, then these arguments are going to go away. So I think that that is potentially the really strong and interesting argument. Now, whether this is going to be considered within um, Belsner and Can, of course, it is another issue, but if it's not going to be um, considered here, I, I know that it's certainly a matter that's been run in other arguments elsewhere. Kevin's already mentioned Swan and um, so Swan, which was dealt with before District Judge Reen. The argument is, is reflected there. It's not um, traversed in great length, but it is, it's reflected there. And there's a couple of paragraphs that deal with it where um, District Judge Ruin um, broadly says, I I'm not convinced that this is a part, uh, is, is an issue for a solicitor act assessment, but I've already dealt with the other reasons why I'm not uh, engaging with this issue anyway. So you have this ability, um, it seems to me, to, to be bringing these other arguments elsewhere. There are also a, a number of other cases, aren't there, Kevin, which have been dealt with down in the SCCO at the moment which um, will be of significant interest as well. Yeah, there, uh, my understanding is a couple of hundred cases being case managed by Master Rowley um, uh, and they're at various stages of, of progression 
Um, it may be that we get a decision on those pre the Court of Appeal in Belsner. I, I think it's more likely that we do. Um, but we'll, we'll, time will tell, and I, I won't foreshadow those arguments or um, the conclusions in those cases. I, I think the last issue that we want to just touch on very quickly is what informed consent will look like. We've, we've focused really um, on the issues of whether or not the, the arguments can be run, if they can, is there a fiduciary duty at all? If there is, and it's breached, what's the consequence? And the last thing, and it's more straightforward, so we can deal with it very briefly, is if informed consent is required, what does that informed consent look like? Um, what's required? And it, it seems to us that obviously the written agreement needs to expressly permit charges above that which is recoverable into parties. But if Mr. Justice Lavender's decision in Belsner is correct, what additional costs information is required? Um, the obvious answer to that is a fairly detailed matrix of these are the various stages at which your case can settle. If your case settles at that stage, this is the estimate of our costs at that point on an hourly rate basis. And if it settles at that point, this is the amount of fixed costs that you will recover, or this is how fixed costs will be calculated. And there are, there are effectively three different sections, if you like, to that. The first is the portal, those cases which stay on the portal. And you can say stage, um, well, some might be to settle at stage one, but you could say stage one, stage two, stage three. The third is those cases that fall off the portal uh, and fall within the fixed cost regime at um, section three, <laughs> uh, A through J. Um, and you can say, well, if um, a, a case settles post issue pre-allocation, this is our cost estimate. And this is um, the amount of fixed costs, or at least how it's calculated, depending on the percentage of damages and what your damages are. And then lastly, those cases which will be few and far between almost certainly um, uh, in this sort of litigation, but it's important and sensible to have it in there. Those cases that fall off the portal because they became far more valuable than one ever anticipated, uh, or for any other reason, those cases are allocated to the multi-track in which case you can give a cost estimate, but then you can go back to what might be called pre-Jackson, pre-fixed costs estimate of you'll recover some, but not all of these costs. We usually recover between X percent and Y percent on an inter-parties assessment, so, so, uh, so on and so forth. So setting out that information is a burden, but it's not certainly not impossible, mm -hmm. which was the phrase used by um, District Judge Ruin in Swan, or, or rather I say, in my humble opinion, I don't think it's impossible, but it is certainly a burden. Um, the other thing that you can and should do is if you are going to impose an overall cap on the liability to the client, and most firms do in my experience, and even in Belsner, um, they did limit what they charged the client to the success fee. Um, they just weren't contractually obliged to limit it. So if you're going to limit it anyway, and as I say, most firms do, then include it in the, in the retainer. And the importance of that overall cap was, was set out by District Judge Ruin in Swan in what was a, a, it's a lengthy transcript of a judgment given orally, so it doesn't perhaps read as well as a written judgment would. Um, but the uh, question of informed consent was tied heavily to that overall cap where a client had been told, whatever happens, we can't tell you what your damages are going to be, we can't tell you what our costs are going to be, and we can't tell you what you're going to recover. But whatever happens, you will keep 75% of your damages, and we will only take 25%. That will be the cap. Um, and he said that that was informed consent, because even though the client didn't know exactly how much was going to be recovered, or even broadly how much was going to be recovered, depending on when the case settled, what the client did know is 75% of their damages were safe. So it's worth having a look through that, um, uh, that, that case. Um, it's 10 past five, so I know that we've gone on a little bit further than we indicated that we would. The last point is about managing risk uh, and what can you do now to um, avoid these difficulties in this interim period before we know what the Court of Appeal is going to do with Belsner. I think Erica could pick that up just briefly. Yeah, certainly from my experience, a lot of these cases at the moment are just um, uh, being stayed 
because they're either being caught by Belsner or they're being caught by the cases which are currently before Master Rowley. So um, as a result of that, it does seem to me that if any of these do land on your doorstep, that um, you ought to be sensibly be able to ask for a stay pending the outcome of these cases. And the reality is, is that the district bench is so overwhelmed um, generally at present that um, the um, ability to allow um, uh, a different judge, perhaps of a higher standing to determine these issues is very attractive. And I suspect it's one that they are, are an exit door that they will happily take. So that's one thing that you can do, certainly. Secondly, um, it, what the reality is is that these get these cases really get split into three different sections so you've got your old historic cases which are already covered by your retainers which have been concluded now there's no ability to amend your retainer following conclusion of the um costs um and the the fact that the claimant you know that the contract's been concluded and the claimants at the damages and you know it's halfway down you know the, the six months later on 12 months later on down the year there's nothing really you can do about those except absolutely managing the risk and um in my opinion certainly the best way to be going around doing that is to take if these cases land on your doorstep is to take a real realistic view um and a, a litigation risk view as to whether you are likely to be able to be um coming up against these arguments and if so what your exposure to your cases is going to be and if it's the case that you can't get these stayed though at the moment i would suspect that there is a significantly high chance of being able to stay them mm -hmm. if you can't get them stayed then make an offer because the aim of the game here is very much to keep as much money in your back pocket as you possibly can and that's spread across not only making refunds but also limiting your exposure to um, solicitor act assessment costs down the line so making very decent offers very early on is the best way that you can do to protect yourself as you will know the one-fifth rule creates the um cost shifting or, or governs the cost shifting aspect in solicitor act assessments anything 20 percent or above so um 20 to zero percent that's been reduced from the bill the solicitor gets the costs anything there um downwards the client gets the cost so in order for a solicitor to, to increase their level of cost protection the reality is that you're going to have to be making offers which are greater than 20 percent because if you make an offer within that 20 percent all you're doing is just reiterating what you already have so that's um number one number two are those cases which are still live and have haven't concluded and those cases what I would do um, again is take a very sensible risk view of the retainer coverage that you have at the moment and have your retainers reviewed properly so that you can see the full extent of the risk that you're likely to face and those cases which haven't settled yet are still capable of being remedied it will be tricky it's not the most straightforward thing to do but it is possible so don't despair we can fit we, we can within means you know try and fix those for you and then the third category of cases are those cases which are moving forward which you haven't had in the door yet again these will be covered by taking a very decent review of your retainers uh, and making sure that they're as watertight as um, can be made now of course it's not possible to fully um, anticipate every argument that's coming over the hill but it's certainly possible to to limit risk in terms of the provisions of the retainers Retainers. So um, those are the things certainly that I would recommend doing. Kevin? Yeah, I, I think all of that's right. Uh, and of course, there, you'll be taking on new clients every day. So that robust review of the retainer now um, is truly a time is of the essence. You ought to be looking at retainers with these issues in mind. And even if you take the view that there isn't a fiduciary duty, or even if you take the view that well, most of my cases settle at st stage two, and so section 74.3 won't bite, um, it, it would be a fool's errand to just plough on in the hope that the Court of Appeal follows that view um, when um, some tweaks to a retainer at this stage for new clients yeah. um, it is likely going to close the door on any of these potential arguments in the future. And it's just sensible to have your retainers reviewed every 12, 12 18 months anyway as a matter of, as a matter of course. Um, and certainly, you know, what you can do is have your retainers review now and then in 12 months time, you're probably going to be in a situation where you've had the Belsner decision out and you can look at them again.
So well done to the um, 166 of you who managed to stay to the end. Gold stars all around. There are a couple of questions in the Q&A. Just before I go on to the Q&A, um, thank you to Jed, who uh, was involved in the Bellamy matter at first instance, excuse me, the Belsner matter at first instance before Judge Bellamy, who says that the argument about Section 74 and whether it applies to cases which weren't issued um, was run. And Bellamy took the view that um, it, it did apply to cases, uh, even if they hadn't been issued. Um, albeit that wasn't necessarily apparently apparent from the judgment. So it may well be that that's an issue which is addressed to some extent by... Um, I understand it. Um, that's very much the view that's taken in Sheffield. It's not just Bellamy that takes that very, view. Right. But very strongly in that view as well, <laughs> just as a bit of insight got it for you. Um, the, there is another question. Well, there's two questions in the Q&A. So Wendy asks, does there need to be a specific reference to section 74.3? in the retainer or can an appropriate paragraph be sufficient? Um, my view would be it doesn't necessarily need to identify the statute, but if you're going to draft a provision that deals with it, then I would, um, yeah. just, just in case somebody um, more authoritative than me takes a different view. Yeah. Um, there's it's certainly no harm in making that reference. In all the retainers I draft, I include a paragraph which makes the explicit um, explanation, but also refers to section 74.3 by name. And I can see Eric and nodding. Yeah, that's that's very much the gateway provision. If, yeah. you, if you are determined to have an insufficient paragraph such that it's expressly set out, then you're, you're not even going to get into an argument of whether there's a fiduciary relationship or not. You're not going to satisfy the gateway provision. So it, as Kevin said, it's if you're going to be drafting this type of provision anyway, and you will need to have this within your retainers, it's sensible to go the full hog and make it as expressly clear and as um, sufficiently aligned with the provision as you can in order to have a very belt braces super glue approach to um, you, your drafting, which um, it is very much the, the approach that um, I certainly take. I know Kevin takes and the, the entirety really of the King's team take, isn't it really, Kevin, when, yeah. when we're drafting retainers? Yeah. The uh, um, second question came in from Anonymous. Um, is an issued case where the defendant makes a global offer for costs and damages, where the claimant and their solicitors agree a division between damages and costs, can the client then seek a solicitor act assessment if there's no deduction to the claimant's costs? So I guess from this situation that you are just recover, you are just um, charging to the client the amount that you've recovered into parties and you're making no additional charge. If you're just keeping the amount that you've recovered as in a, a, an old CFA light situation, then you're not going to be getting into a situation where you're looking for a, a deduction from damages such that you would be engaging 74.3 um, or indeed one of the, the um, success fee provisions, um, it, it seems to me. But it's certainly if you're going to be charging a success fee, which is not entirely clear from the example, um, Belsner, the success fee really was all that they charged and it was governed not to be or determined not to be recoverable. So um, if you are making any sort of deduction, whether it be shortfall or whether it be success fee, you do need to have the 73, 74.3 provision in there. Again, belt braces, super glue approach. It, it doesn't take an extensive amount of time to include these provisions if you're having a review of your retainer anywhere. And the pervasive benefit that you will get from it far outweigh the um, additional fraction of a cost it would take in reality to include these provisions across the board. Yeah, it's seconds. And I think that answers uh, Thomas's question as well. Does it make a difference if there's no shortfall provision in the CFA? Um, no, because you still need to explain to the, uh, the client that you can take more from them than will be recovered from the other side. Um, that, that gateway provision, as Erica calls it. Um, I think the last question, which was in the chat box um, from John, just as a retrospective retainer might have a bearing on the fiduciary duty, would also the cooling off period in accordance with the cancellation of contract regs, enabling a client to cancel a retainer. Um, I, I'm not sure that would have a huge impact because that, that ability to cancel a retainer within that period, I don't think you could say that therefore extinguishes um, a client's right if a fiduciary duty is breached to void avoidable contract if that's the question mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that's likely to affect whether or not there is a fiduciary duty I suppose your argument could be well during that period they can 
take advice or take yeah. abuse. But I, I'm not sure that's the purpose really of the cooling off period. I, I don't think that one provision would be capable of being extinguished because of a provision in the um, the. the because these, of course, um, are enshrined to, to a large degree as well within the um, Consumer Rights Act yeah. of 2014. So I, I doubt very much that there's going to be a significant read across from one provision to the other to extinguish it. Um, I, I think it's a good question, John, but I'm not entirely, I'm with Kevin on this. I, I don't think it's going to make a significant difference to extinguishing the argument. Yeah. Okay, that's all of the questions in the Q&A. Um, if there's any more for any more, please jot them down now and we'll try and answer them. We'll stay on for another couple of minutes. If not, thanks very much for attending, everybody. It's really appreciated. I hope it's been useful. What we will do with the slides is we'll get those sent out to you to the email address that you registered for the talk at um, uh, tomorrow. And if anybody has any questions, you'll see on the last slide our, our email addresses. Please feel free to, uh, to drop us a line and we'll try and do our best to answer them. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Good night.